uh, when it needs to be focused on God this morning. A second thing, if you can do this morning, especially if you're visiting, is fill out an attendance card. You'll find that on the back of the pew in front of you. If you'll fill that out with your information and drop it in the collection plate as it passes between the pews, we would greatly appreciate that as well. Several things to announce as we begin this morning. Those who remember in our prayers, it seems like some Sundays we get more uh, to remember in our prayers. And today is one of those days. We want to remember, I was given this note, uh, Sandy Garner's brother, Dan Crawford, passed away Friday evening, November the 9th. Uh, please pray for the Garners as they travel to Memphis, Tennessee. And so um, we, we are sorry for their loss, and we also pray for their travels as they travel to Memphis Mark Etheridge, who has been struggling with cancer, I was told and informed this morning that he has a new address and that it is posted on the bulletin board if you want to get that address in order to contact him. And um, Ashley Johnson, Ashley Johnson, the daughter of uh, the Johnsons, they have, uh, Ashley will have her thyroid removed and so they pray for, uh, ask for prayers uh, that all will go well with that. Hugh Kelly fell. Uh, I was told he might be in the emergency room this morning. Uh, I'm not positive about it. He fell, had some things uh, that, that he has injured, and we pray for him and that he will be able to be back with us uh, short, uh, quickly. That's all that we're going to announce as we begin. It is the Lord's Day. It is Sunday. and so glad to see everyone here, but it is also Veterans Day. And we always have several who have served in our armed forces, and we want you to know that we appreciate you and that we are so thankful for your service, and we hope that we can exp express that to you today. As we begin, we will have our first song, 943, if you want to use the songbooks, 943. It'll also be on the screens behind me. We will open this morning with a reading of God's Word, 1 Timothy 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. We will have that read to us, but if you want to put a ribbon there and leave it, it'll serve as a good outline for Dave's lesson. Our scriptures will be taken from 1 Timothy 6, verses 3 through 12. That's 1 Timothy 6, verses 3 through 12, and I'll be reading from the King James Version. If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to the wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but donning about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railing, evil surmising, perverse disputing of men of corrupt minds and destitute of truth, supposing that gain is godliness, for such withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be worthy, worthy and content. But they that will be rich fall into, into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drawn men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some covet after, they have erred from the, from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, and love, and patience, and meekness. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and has professed a good profession before many witnesses." Nine forty three. <clears throat> I love you, Lord, and I live my voice to worship you, oh my soul rejoice, take joy, my king. Hey. 
may it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. 583. Sing to me of heaven, sing that song of peace From the toil that by me it will bring release Burdens will be lifted that are pressing So showers of great blessings all my heart will flow Sing to me of heaven, let me fondly dream Of its golden glory, of its pearly gleam Sing to me when shadows of the evening fall Sing to me of heaven, sweetest song of all Sing to me of heaven tenderly and low Till the shadows o'er me rise and swiftly go When my heart is weary, when the day is long Sing to me of heaven, sing that old sweet song Sing to me of heaven, let me fondly dream Of its golden glory, of its pearly gleam Sing to me when shadows of the evening fall Sing to me of heaven, sweetest song of all 708 Walking in sunlight all of my journey Over the mountain, through the deep vale Jesus has said, I'll never forsake thee Promise divine that never can fail Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight Flooding my soul with glory divine Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing his praises, Jesus is mine. In the bright sunlight, ever rejoicing, pressing my way to mansions above. Singing his praises, gladly I'm walking, Walking in sunlight, sunlight of love. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing his praises, Jesus is mine. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful Lord's Day and the blessings of it. We thank you for this opportunity we have to come study the Word. Pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll be with the sick, especially, Heavenly Father, that you'll pre be with Larry Fields and his, and his pacemaker and help that uh, helps him make him feel better and he can be back with us soon. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll be with Debbie Walling as she uh, has to have some more knee surgery. Pray, Heavenly Father, she'll be with Miss Sister Gillespie, Miss G. Pray that you'll help her recover from her foot, foot injury. Pray, Heavenly Father, she'll be with Hugh. Help that his uh, back will not be a big burden to him, and he can be with us soon, too. Pray, Heavenly Father, she'll be with uh, my daughter-in-law, Ashley, as she recovers from her thyroid surgery. May it, uh, she have a full recovery from it. We pray, Heavenly Father, she'll be with the ones that are lost loved ones, especially the Garners, and be with them as they uh, travel. Pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll be with the elders as they uh, oversee the congregation here. Pray that you'll be with Tom and, and Jim and Jim and Greg as they uh, watch over the flock. Pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll be with the deacons as they perform the tasks that are assigned to them. 
Now, Heavenly Father, we pray that you'll be with Dave as he brings us to the lesson of the hour. Help him have a ready recollection of the things that he's prepared. Be with us, Lord, and thank for his son, your son Jesus, who died on the cross for our sins. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Eight hundred seventy four. Sing this song before the Lord's Supper. Eight seven four. Jesus is Lord, my Redeemer. How he loves me, how I love him. He is risen, he is coming. Lord, come quickly. Precious is he, he that cometh, I will love him, I will serve him, when he comes with shouts of glory, I will join him, hallelujah. As we gather around the table this morning, our hearts and our minds need to go back, back a couple of thousand years, as we paint in our mind that visual picture of our Lord and Savior as he hung on the cross. A very somber moment, but yet a very joyous moment is about to follow. As Jesus hung on that cross, and endured that physical death, a lot of pain, suffering, a lot of emotions, as we see written in the scriptures. And then he died, and he was buried. But as children of God, we understand the rest of that story. That because of that resurrection from the grave, we have hope. Our God in his infinite wisdom has given us the opportunity each first day of the week to observe this memorial feast. But ask the men to come together at this particular time as we share in the example that was set many years ago. Let's pray together. Our Holy Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your wisdom to give us this opportunity to gather around this table, to remember this great sacrifice that you gave us, your only begotten Son, that lived a life as an example for us to follow, but more importantly, gave up that life as a sacrifice for our sins. As we partake of this bread, which so fittingly represents that body that was nailed to the cross, helps to do so in a way that would be acceptable to you, knowing, Heavenly Father, that this sacrifice made all eternity possible. Help us as we clear our minds. May you accept this sacrifice as our emotions dictate. 
We ask this prayer in your son's name. Amen. Let's continue our prayer. Father, it is with joy that we partake in this portion of the sacrifice. As we think about this emblem, that the fruit of the vine, which represents to us, your children, the blood of our Savior. We know, Heavenly Father, that this blood continually cleanses us from our sins. This blood redeems us. We pray, Heavenly Father, that as we partake of it, we might partake of it in a fashion that would be acceptable to you, always giving thanks for that sacrifice. And it's in your Son's name we ask this prayer. Amen.
as the men are gathered, we have an opportunity to lay by in store, as it were, our offering. Have you ever considered how blessed you really are? When I think about it, we live in one of the greatest countries on this planet. We are truly blessed. We're also children of the Most High God. We are more blessed. So the way I see it, we are the most blessed of the most blessed. If that doesn't excite you, I don't know what can. We have an opportunity to thank God for that. We understand that what God gives us is not ours. It belongs to Him. Everything belongs to Him. We are but caretakers and stewards of that. But where we're at today, we have the opportunity to give back a very small portion of what he has been blessed us with. Let's pray together. Our Holy Father, we, we thank you for all that you do for us. We know that you supplied all our needs, many of our wants, much of what we do not deserve. We know, Heavenly Father, you've made us promises, and we know that you'll keep those promises. We understand, Heavenly Father, that we must follow your will as we live here on this earth. Help us to take the blessings that we have been blessed with. Share them in a way that you would have it. To bring praise and honor and glory to your kingdom while we're here. Knowing all the time that this life is temporal. And yet we are looking for that hope that you've given us through all eternity. And it's in your son's name we ask this prayer. Amen. Our next song this morning, 430, 430. <clears throat> My name is in the book of life, oh bless the name of Jesus. I rise above all doubt and strife and read my title clear. I know, I know my name is there i know i know my name is written there my name were troubled often cast a shadow o'er my title but now with full salvation blessed by god is ever clear i know i know my name is there, I know, I know, my name is written there. <clears throat> Please mark song number 655, 655. morning. I'm glad to see everyone here. I want to preface what I have to say this morning by asking, do
do not dwell. Don't leave here dwelling on the horror of some of the things I'm talking about. Now with that disclaimer, keep that in mind. His name was Albert Otto Walter Meyer. He was born in April 1892. He enlisted in the Imperial German Army at the age of 20 in 1912. By August of 1914, he had attained the rank of Leutnant, a lieutenant in the cavalry in the 29th Cavalry Brigade of the 29th German Army Division. On August the 2nd, 1914, he and a German patrol crossed the border from Mulhaus in Saxony, Alsace-Lorraine, which now belongs to France, but was belong, it belonged to Germany in those days. He crossed the border from Germany into France, and his patrol met a garrison of French soldiers stationed at Yonchereau. After injuring one of the French soldiers with his saber, Leutnant Meyer shot and further wounded a French corporal, Jules André Pujot. Pujot's men returned fire, killing Albert Meyer. He was buried the next day with full military honors in the cemetery at Yonchereau, France. And his body was later moved back into Germany after World War I. Albert Otto Walter Meyer is counted as the first official military casualty of World War I even though he actually died the day before the war began. Four and a half years later, and more than eight million combat casualties later, United States Army Private Henry Nicholas John Gunther, who was ironically a first-generation American born of German parents who had immigrated, Gunther was shot and killed on November 11th, 1918 at 10.59 a.m. The German soldiers who shot him tried to warn him away. An armistice had been signed between the combatant powers at 5 a.m. that morning, local time. All fighting, all shooting, all wounding, all killing was supposed to cease at 11 a.m. It said that the French General Marshal Foch who was the Supreme Allied Commander, refused to allow the order to go into effect the moment that it was signed, and that cost more than 11,000 additional lives in the six hours between 5 a.m. and 11 a.m. that day. The very last one of them was Henry Gunther. That morning, Private Gunther, who had been a sergeant and had been busted, for complaining about his duties, Gunther went out with his patrol, determined to make good in the war while he still could. Seeing the German emplacement, he advanced and refused to be turned away, refused to turn away, fired at the Germans, and they had basically no choice but to return fire. They killed him in self-defense literally in the last minute of the war. He is officially the last combat casualty of World War I. 
the Great War, as, as it was known until World War II, began with a political assassination in Sarajevo in what was then Serbia. The Austro-Hungarian Empire that ruled that area, along with Imperial Germany, the nation of Italy, and the Ottoman Turkish Empire, formed what was known then as the Triple Alliance. On the other side, Imperial Russia, France, and Great Britain formed what came to be known as the Triple Entente, supporting Serbia. They were later joined in 1917 by the United States. These nations were far larger, far stronger militarily, far more powerful than either the, ha the Hungarian Empire or the Serbian nation by itself. The actual cause of the war was soon forgotten as the empires and the mighty nations concentrated on trying to destroy one another. The First World War introduced the world to the horrors of what is euphemistically called modern warfare. Things like automatic weapons, land mines, tank warfare, airplanes and aerial bombing, incendiary bombing, poison gases, mustard gas, chlorine gas, and even biological weapons. When the killing finally stopped, between 15 and 19 million people had died and more than 24 million had been wounded in some way. The carnage cost 1,800,000 German soldiers and sailors killed in combat plus up to a million more who died indirectly as a result of the war. 1.7 million Russian soldiers killed in combat, plus about three quarters of a million non-combat casualties. One million Austrians, plus half a million more non-combat casualties. About half a million Italian combat deaths with 200,000 non-combat deaths. 300,000 Turkish soldiers, plus many more, not as well documented, not in combat. Almost three quarters of a million British and colonial soldiers died, plus about 250,000 more non-combat deaths. France lost 1.15 million soldiers in combat, plus about 250,000 more. Serbia, the little Eastern European nation where it all began, lost 127,000 soldiers in combat and 300,000 more in non-combat injuries. The United States, which did not even enter the war until the last year of it, lost, uh, lost 53,402 combat casualties plus about 63,000 more non-combat casualties, all military personnel. Millions upon millions fighting, killing, dying because of the disagreements the arguments, the pride, the vanity of their leaders and their nations. Christians, oh, and here's the irony, both sides claimed God is on our side. Christians are soldiers in God's spiritual Army. Last month, a, a month ago today, we studied the idea that 
soldiery is part of our identity, spiritually speaking, as Christians. And we looked at passages like 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 2, 3, and 4, and, and, and Paul's description of the Christian soldier's equipment, armor, weaponry, in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, we read, The things you've heard from me among many witnesses, the same commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself in the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. War is horrible. People get killed in wars. People are severely wounded, permanently hurt, injured, maimed, crippled, disabled by warfare. Combat creates broken hearts makes widows out of wives, orphans out of children, and it causes immense economic damage to everyone involved. War results. Even what Thomas Aquinas once described as just warfare, justified warfare, even that all war, all combat results one way or another from disagreement and sin. And inevitably, it harms far more than just those who are active combatants in it. One hundred years ago this morning, what was called the war to end all wars ended. The guns fell silent. Peace was restored. Or so they thought. This is a very somber anniversary for a lot of people. You see, there are no World War I veterans anymore. They're all gone. Veterans of World War II, like my dad, are passing from this life at a rate of about 1,400 per day. In another few years, there won't be any of them left in this world. And then it will be the Korean War veterans and then the Vietnam veterans and so on and so on if time stands. This is a very somber anniversary for a lot of families. And as we think about the tragedy that it marks, and warfare is always tragic, I want us to also think about the ongoing war in which every Christian participates today. I said I don't want you to go home thinking about the horrors of warfare. We're going to talk about that some more. Be forewarned. But if that's all you take home, you're missing the point of what we're talking about. So listen and think carefully with me. First, I want you to think about, as Christians, why we fight. During World War II, there were a series of propaganda films produced by the United States government that, that were all entitled, Why We Fight. And their purpose was to try to explain why the United States, this mighty nation protected by oceans on both sides, why it was involved only 21 years after the fact in an even greater war than the war to end all wars. As Christians, though, why do we fight? We fight. We're soldiers because sin is in the world. 
Genesis chapter 3 tells us how that happened. We didn't choose it. We didn't ask for it. Adam and Eve sinned and the consequences came on us. It's not our fault. We didn't choose this. Or did we? Have you ever been tempted? Have you ever been tempted strongly enough that you gave in? Have you ever in your life needed the blood of Jesus for your soul's salvation? If you can raise your hand and answer yes or nod, you did cause it. You're part of the problem. But regardless of our participation, Sin impacts everyone, even the innocent, even the little ones that have not yet learned how to sin. Even they are impacted by it. In Romans chapter 5, if you start at verse 8 and go down to verse 12, we read there that God demonstrates His love for us. Take your Bible and turn to Romans chapter 5. I know it's on the screen behind me, but it's good to turn those pages or swipe through that, that digital thing in your hand and read the words for yourself. Romans chapter 5, start at verse 8. He says there, God shows his love for us. This is the English Standard Version. In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we're reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. But go on. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin and so death spread to all men because all sinned for indeed sin was in the world before the law was given but sin is not counted where there's no law yet death reigned from Adam to Moses verse 14 says even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam who was a type of the one to come you see even if we're not direct participants we're still impacted by the carnage that's caused by sin. We fight because sin is in the world. As soldiers in the army of the Lord, we're trying to prevent the issue getting worse. We're trying to show the world there's a solution. The objective of sin is to hurt you. The objective of temptation and sin is to condemn you. The purpose of the devil is to enslave you and everyone else like you. Paul wrote about that when he said in Romans chapter 6, in verse 16, Don't you know? Don't you know that to whom you present yourselves as slaves to obey... You are that one's slaves whom you obey. If you give in to temptation and you sin, you become the slave of sin. It's accomplished its purpose. Whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. Nothing good comes from sin. Nothing good comes from sin, despite the way temptation looks, despite the way it appeals to us, despite the world around us extolling its blessings and benefits and virtues, nothing good comes from sin. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verses 24 and 25, we read about Moses in Egypt, choosing to suffer hardship with God's people rather than enjoy what? what what's, what's that, how does that passage describe it? The pleasures of sin for a season. You see, that, that momentary 
satisfaction of desire is exactly that. It's momentary. Then the satisfaction is gone and the consequences remain. James tells us very plainly in James chapter 1 and verse 17 that every good gift, every perfect gift is from above. Pause there. <clears throat> in this combat, in this conflict, in this battle, in this war, there are no good gifts that come from anyone besides God. None. Not even one. Every good thing comes from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation. There's no inconsistency. There's no shadow. No uncertainty with Him. Every good thing comes from Him even though everything about war is ultimately horrible, why do we fight? Because we're on the right side. We are on the right side if we're Christians. We're on the right side and it is a just Conflict, it is a just war. Thomas Aquinas was right about that in concept. We're on the right side and it is a just war because the combat, the war that we're involved in, seeks freedom for those who are enslaved in sin. In John chapter 8 and verses 34, 5, and 6, Jesus said, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is the slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. That's why we fight, to make people free. Not by our abilities, but free through the blood of the Lamb that was shed for every single solitary soul that ever lives. We're on the right side. We fight because it is a just war, because it supports righteousness against the forces of evil. We serve the just God and Savior, according to Isaiah chapter 43, or 45 rather, verse 21. We're on the right side. It is a just war, because our commander offers mercy. He offers forgiveness to every soul, every person who will surrender instead of fighting against him. What does the enemy offer? What does the other side offer? Eternal agony and suffering. Nothing more. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28, 29, and 30, in the passage that we often call the, the beautiful invitation, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. That is, those of you who are struggling under the load of sin's guilt, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Surrender to me and, and do my business. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm meek or gentle and lowly in heart. You shall find rest for your souls, for my yoke, here's the contrast, my yoke is easy. Being the slave of the Christ is easy. And bearing that burden is light compared to the yoke and the burden that the enemy will put on you. Why do we fight? For all of these reasons, we fight for eternal freedom in Christ. War really is horrible. And the soldiers of the king, Christians, need to understand why it's horrible. War is horrible. All wars are horrible because they're avoidable. 
Ours is a spiritual war. According to John chapter 18, verse 36, Jesus says, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight. He's talking to Pilate, and he says to Pilate, If I had a worldly kingdom, you'd see a worldly war. But mine's a spiritual kingdom, so what you'll see is a spiritual combat. But even that spiritual warfare could have been avoided Nobody forced anyone, not even Adam and Eve, to sin. No one of us is ever forced to do what's wrong. That's what causes conflict between us and God. That's what puts us on the wrong side in this war. But nobody ever forces us to that. Remember the words of 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13? There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. God is faithful. He'll not let you be tempted beyond what you're able to bear. Always there's a way of escape. Always there's a way out of doing what's wrong. You're never forced to sin. In Romans chapter 5 verse 1, the Apostle Paul tells us that we can have peace with God. We're justified by faith and because of that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You can't have peace with God on your terms. You can't have peace with God on Satan's terms. You can't bargain with God, but he says, here's how you can have peace with me. War is horrible because it's avoidable. Even this one. Our war is truly horrible because of the nature of the casualties that our enemy causes. I talked about all of those millions of people that were killed in World War I who killed others and were themselves killed, the carnage, the suffering, the death, the agony, and that's nothing by comparison because our enemy causes spiritual death by persuading people to participate in sin. Remember Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, the wages of sin is what? Death. Spiritual separation from God, hopelessness, darkness, agony, isolation in eternity. He causes spiritual death when convicted sinners refuse to surrender to Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 6, verses 12 and 13, Paul instructs us, do not let. Stop right there. It's up to you. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body. I can't help it. Yes, you can. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lusts. Do not present yourselves as your your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. But present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. You see, Paul's telling you it's your choice. You decide which side of the battle to be on. Our enemy causes spiritual death by alienating people from hearing and seeing the value of truth and purity and righteousness. Oftentimes, though, that happens when folks who are on the wrong side of this war see hypocrisy and worldliness and unconcern in Christians. They see atrocities. They see vileness, they see worldliness on the side that claims to be righteous and true. That may cause more Christians to be lost in combat and miss heaven than all other causes combined. War is horrible. War is horrible because it's avoidable. War is horrible because of the casualties and the injuries that it causes. And war is horrible because of the injuries that it inflicts, the collateral damage, if you will, that's done to those who aren't even participating in it. There were a total of roughly 10 million killed in combat during World War I. About 21 million wounded, maimed, hurt, crippled, Almost 8 million civilians were killed. 
in this war, not World War I, this war, our war, know this. Our enemy never fights fair. He always tries to hurt as many people as he can. He always has. He always will. Our spiritual war is horrible because we see the consequences of other people's sins in innocent people's lives. Sometimes we have to face the consequences of our own sins in other people's lives. I didn't mean that to happen. But sin always takes you farther than you meant to go and keeps you longer than you meant to stay and costs you way more than you ever meant to pay, as Coach McCartney used to say. It's horrible because it disheartens us. It can discourage us. It can cause us to be depressed. With every battle it brings to our doorstep, we can feel like, you know, well, the church is shrinking. It's just not growing like it was when I was a kid. We're losing the battle in our society. We, we, th- there's no way we can stem the tide of the way things are changing. That's exactly what the enemy wants us to think. The horribleness of that spiritual war comes home to us when we see loved ones, those who have been with us in the faith, drop out, desert like Demas in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 10. War is horrible because it's easy to lose sight of why we fight. Christians fight in this war to prevent even more casualties. Look at Jude verses 21 and 22 and 23. They're almost at the end of the little one chapter book of Jude. It comes just before the revelation. If you have trouble finding it, go to the very back of the book and then just backtrack till you get back before revelation. Verses 21, 22, and 23 Jude writes, keep yourselves, we could render that as maintain yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life, and have mercy on those who doubt, save others by snatching them out of the fire, to others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Likewise, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22, to the weak, I became as weak that I might win the weak. He didn't say he became weak. I became as weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men for this reason, that I might by all means save some. War is horrible but never lose sight of the fact that you're fighting to save souls. You're fighting to save your own soul. And you're fighting to save as many more as you can. Now I want you to think about why every Christian should do your duty in this battle. If you turn to 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, Peter reminds us, be sober, be vigilant. That means on guard. Your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. We ought to do our duty in this conflict because peace is coming. Those poor men in the German army near Chaumont at 10.59 on November 11th, 1918, knew that peace was coming. So was Private Gunther. Rifle in hand, shooting at them, trying to kill them before the guns fell silent. To defend themselves... They killed him. 
Can you imagine living with the knowledge that you killed the last soldier to die in the war? And that you didn't want to, that you tried to persuade him to turn back. And he would not turn back. We do our duty because peace is coming and we know it. The peace that Jesus promises us though is not peace in the absence of conflict, in the absence of war. It's peace after the war. And he knows how hard that can be for us. He said in John chapter 16 verse 33, in the world you have tribulation. It can be hard to be a good soldier. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world, he said. The Apostle Paul emphasized in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verses 25 and 26 that Christians have a sure hope in the true sense of that word. We have confidence because we are sure. He must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. You see, there's no doubt about the outcome of our conflict. If you look at Hebrews chapter 2 and verses 14 and 15, the Hebrews writer says, Inasmuch then as children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same. Pause there. What he's saying is just like we experience life in this world, Jesus experiences life in this world. So that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and released through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Do you realize what he's really telling us there? The war's over. The outcome is already certain. The whole book of Revelation written to Christians being oppressed and, and, and tormented has one simple message, in the end, our side wins. The only doubt about the ultimate outcome of the war concerns which side each of us will choose to be on. Our duty, our responsibility, the task before us, the privilege that we have is to remain on duty. Serving in faith until the commander returns. In Luke chapter 12 and verses 37 and 38, Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and come and serve them. And if he should come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, if he waits until way up in the wee hours of the morning, Blessed are those servants. John in Revelation chapter 16 and verse 15 says basically the same thing. Just like on November 11th at 11 o'clock 1918 one day the guns of our conflict the noise and the shrieking and the agony of battle in this spiritual conflict, one day that will fall silent. The outcome of our war is already known, according to 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4. Only our own steadfastness in this last battle can be in question. Don't be Private Gunther. Don't be the last casualty in the battle for your soul. It's your choice. We are at war. That's a fact. There's no getting around that. But we know who wins. We know who's already broken the power of the losing side, and that's Jesus. 
We know what the outcome of the war is. There's no doubt. There's no question. The battle is horrible because the enemy is trying to do as much damage as he can, hurt as many of us as he can while he still can. Don't be that last casualty. Don't have that distinction of being the last soul who could have been saved in the war for eternity. Our commander has won the war. He's paid the price. He's offered himself for you. If you need to offer yourself to him in return, if you need to repent of your sins and make the good confession and be baptized into Christ so that you can be added to his army, do it now. Take this moment while you can. It's just a few minutes past 11. A hundred years ago at this hour, the guns fell silent. One day there will be no more clangor of war in spiritual things. And there will be no more opportunity to make things right. If you need to ask for your brothers and sisters to join you at heaven's throne as you seek his forgiveness, you can do that now. The gospel invitation is yours. Seize the moment while Coney comes and leads us while we stand together and sing. Let us haste, oh, haste to it free. Tis a fount of love from the source above, and he bids us all freely drink. Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come? Tis for you and me. Thirsty soul, hear the welcome call. Tis a fountain open for all. There's a living stream with a crystal gleam from the throne of life. Now it flows while the waters roll. Let the weary Hear the call that forth freely goes. Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come? Tis for you and me, thirsty soul. Hear the welcome call. a rock that's cleft and no soul is left that may not is pure water share tis for you and me and this stream I see let us haste and joyfully there will you come to the fountain Will you come? Tis for you and me, thirsty soul. Hear the welcome call. Tis a fountain open for all. Please be seated. We have a chance and an opportunity to pray for and with our sister Rosalind Walker today on uh, two counts. She asked prayers first for her mama, who's been sick, she, she writes, but is getting better. But she says, please keep her in your prayers. And that's her, really a great thing to say for us, for any of us. And her mother's name is Minnie Marshall. So we're certainly going to pray for that lady. 
And Roz says, I'm also asking your prayers on my behalf that I remain focused on the prize and not allow myself to spiral downward due to life issues, which is, I think, a very well-worded note that I don't know anybody among us or among any of our friends or neighbors who that does not apply to. Let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Father God, we ask you to continue to bless Sister Walker and her family. We ask you to take care continually of her mother, Miss Marshall, Minnie Marshall. We're thankful to you that she is getting better. We pray that we'll always thank you when we know loved ones or even acquaintances who have medical difficulties and they are getting better. We thank you for that. We thank you for the times we've seen that so often among our congregation. And we pray that that will continue to be the course for Minnie Marshall. And we pray for our spiritual health, Father, as we pray for and with our sister Rosalind, who asks to not let life issues divert her from keeping her eyes on the prize. We're all guilty of doing that. We know, Father, and we pray for your forgiveness and we thank you for giving that forgiveness. We pray that when all of the many different kinds of difficulties we face because of circumstances that we can't control like health issues or because of wrong decisions that sometimes we make ourselves and sometimes those close to us who we care about make or whatever the circumstance is that causes us worry and often grief help us father to remember first the best place to turn truly the only place to turn for comfort real comfort for answers is to you and we thank you for being there and allowing us to talk to you asking you for your help we also thank you, Father, for your church, and putting in that church brothers and sisters who we can turn to and can help us with comfort by praying for us. Please help us not to forget that these are great blessings that only come through your Son and are only found in him and in his body, the church. Help us to be that church as strong and as deeply rooted and as forward-looking and as loving to one another as you want it to be. Forgive us when we fail in those things. But again, Father, we thank you for all that you do give us, including that forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen. Just allow me to make a correction. I announced Ashley Johnson. She's having her thyroid removed. I said that it was the Johnson's daughter, and I knew that it was their daughter-in-law. And I met Ashley and Clark. Clark is their son. Uh, I met them at Camp Inagahi, and they are members at Peachtree City. Uh, and Ashley is having her thyroid removed. So uh, wanted to make that small correction, uh, but still remember them in your prayers. So many uh, events to remember and hopefully make plans to attend. We had one yesterday that was just great. And thank you to Stan and everyone who made it a success. We had our health fair at Lakewood Church of Christ. And um, we had so many people that went from here that, that volunteered. We might, you could say, had too many uh, workers and when you compared the workers to the people that came in, it almost seemed like we had too many, but that is not a problem. Uh, just so good to see everyone that went yesterday, and uh, hopefully we made a good impact there in that area. Coming up tonight after evening worship, the youth, that's youth of all ages, whoever wants to attend, parents welcome as well, will eat out. We do this once a month. Uh, we'll find a restaurant and go enjoy food and fellowship. 
There will be a progressive dinner. This is for our 6th through 12th graders. We did it last year. We'll do it again this year. A progressive dinner on December the 15th. Uh, There is a sign-up sheet on the youth bulletin board. If you'll take a left and go to the bulletin boards, there is a bulletin board that says Youth News. There's a a sign-up sheet uh, for you to host one of the four uh, courses of the meal of the meal that we will have. I believe that dessert has already been spoken for. I don't think it's on the sheet, but dessert dessert has been spoken for. Uh, but we do need appetizer, main course, or salad and main course to be hosted. That's December fifteenth. Uh, there will also be a sixth through twelfth grade cheesecake factory trip again this year. I'm not exactly sure the date. I'm going to kind of survey the parents and see what date works the best. It'll be sometime in December, but we do that every year again with our middle and high schoolers. So be ready and be thinking about that trip. Saturday for the Savior will be this Saturday at 10 o'clock in the Fellowship Hall. We'll do cookies and gift baskets. Uh, I think it's for our widows and widowers, and Jean Johnson really heads that up. So if you have any questions, ask her. There will be a family Christmas party this year, December the 1st. All of the information is in your bulletin, but want to encourage you to make ten, uh, plans to attend that. One, one, one last thing that I'll announce is if you are curious about the box on the table in the foyer, uh, there's a box that says thankful, I think, and something where you can drop into the top of it. Uh, that is for what we have at the end of this month or towards the end of this month. We have a thanks uh, service, thankful service. Um, towards the end of this month, and that is for you to write something down that you are thankful for. And again, we have a lot of blessings. So just write something, anything, multiple things that you're thankful for, put it in that box, and that will come into play for that service, and um, take part in that. Other than that, there's several other announcements in the bulletin, but um, consult that for those other events. Please stand. We'll sing 756 and then have our closing prayer. 756, please stand. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansion, bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus we'll see let's pray together our God our Father in heaven with thankfulness we come to your throne. Thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. We're assured that we have been edified and uplifted. We pray that our service might be lifted up as a sweet-smelling aroma to you. We thank you at this time for all the veterans of times gone by that protected our freedom, those currently serving, and their families. They're on guard to protect the freedoms that we have in this country. We thank you also, Heavenly Father, for the soldiers of the cross that Brother Dave spoke about this morning. We know that the victory is already won, but please be with us as you lead us through the battles of life. Help us to fight for the souls of others. We know, Heavenly Father, that as we have just sang, the victory is yours. And we know that victory is yours, and that was conquered through the sacrifice of your Son through death and resurrection, that we might all have hope in eternity with you. And we ask this prayer in his name.